Hey everyone, on today's episode of the Security Swarm Podcast, I've got Michael Posey on, and we're going to be talking about the findings from our most recent edition of the Monthly Threat Report. Now, the Monthly Threat Report here at Hornet Security is a report that we do once a month that highlights some of our key data findings from our security services that we provide in the industry, as well as provide some commentary on a lot of the big happenings in the industry. So for example, this month we're going to be talking about the Cyber Safety Review Board's findings on the storm. 0558 incident from last year. We're going to be talking about uh, the FTC's reports on impersonation attacks costing victims $1.1 billion. And we also provide some commentary on the XZ Utils fiasco that's currently going on in the open source community. So that and lots more on today's episode of the Security Swarm Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back for another episode of the Security Swarm Podcast, the podcast that brings you the knowledge and insights straight from the security lab here at Hornet Security. As always, I'm your host, Andy Serwich, and I've got a new face on the show today. I've got Michael Posey. How's it going, Michael? Good, Andy. Thanks for having me. Um, And for those that obviously don't know me, um, I've been working with businesses uh, around technology for the last 18 years, specifically the last 16 uh, with MSPs around email, email security, archiving, anything that's compliance related. Um, and just basically helping MSPs understand how they can implement technology into their stack and their day-to-day business to help their businesses grow and be more efficient. So you're one of those, uh, I've heard people tell me, rare individuals uh, like me that speaks uh, tech, sales, and marketing, which is, you know, kind of- I'm innocent. (laughs) You got me mistaken, though. No, of course, it is. It's It's a funny thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it sort of resonates with me. Historically, I've always been a tech person, um, but I found my way to, to being more of a salesperson that, that can speak tech and sort of boil it down to the, the non-technical users as well uh, when the time arises. So yeah, it's a, it's a good trait and good gift, I suppose. It, it's definitely nice and it's definitely helpful for conversations <laughs> like we're having today. So I appreciate sure. you taking the time to come on the show and, and share your insights with us today. And uh, for those watching, uh, today's episode is one of our recurring monthly threat report episodes. Every month here at Hornet Security, we uh, take a look at our data and we provide some insights on that data, as well as provide some commentary on some of the big news items that have been happening in the space lately. And uh, when I put this report together this month, just like happened last month and is, has been happening more frequently lately, I sit down and I look at all of the cybersecurity news things that have happened over the last 30 days. And I'm just like, I don't know where to start. Where do, where do I start this month? It's been crazy lately. And I, the, uh, the meme I always quote when I'm thinking about this, you know, that uh, picture of Ben Affleck, he's standing outside with a cigarette and he just looks like he's been through hell. I'm like, (laughs) that's, that's like cybersecurity professionals the last couple of years, right? It's just, uh, anyway, my point yeah, I mean, is it, the good thing is at least it's not the same puzzle over and over again. It's right. It's, exactly. Yeah. It's something new. And I think that's, that's important, right? Cause if it was the same puzzle over and over again, you know, people tend to get complacent and miss stuff because they're bored. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I, that is the silver lining, I guess. And uh, cybersecurity is definitely a space where you're not going to get bored. That's for sure. So but anyway, the the three uh, news items that we're talking about uh, in today's episode, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about um, the uh, CSRB, the Cybersecurity Review Board of the U.S. government, their uh, released reports on the findings of the Microsoft Storm 0558 attack, which we've talked about extensively on this uh, this this show. We're also going to talk about uh, the FTC's report about uh, impersonation scams topping 1.1 billion U.S. dollars in damages, which Michael and I were talking before that we hit record. We feel like it's a little low, but we're going to get into that. Yeah, uh, and then we're, right, exactly. And then uh, we also are going to talk about uh, the back door that was recently discovered in the open source XZ Utils package. So. Lots to unpack today, but I guess, Michael, what do you think? Do you, should we start with our uh, our data from this data period, and then uh, we'll go from there? Yeah, let's get the boring stuff out of the way, right? You know, that's right. People, that's people right. love numbers and graphs and things like that, so let's, let's talk right. about that, and then we'll get into the discussion points, I suppose. Exactly. 
So uh, what we'll do is we'll go through um, our main data points here, and I'll link uh, in the show notes to the full report here. So if you want to go see, you know, the numbers and the graphs and how we calculate things, and because I know some people are very math focused and want to see how the math is, well, mathed, right? Um, you'll have a link to that in the show notes. But in terms of our data, what we found during this data period, and the data period for this report is uh, March 1st to April 1st, essentially. And so we found during this data period that the amount of easily identifiable and ultimately rejected email threats has increased, and there's been a slight decrease in the amount of more targeted and sophisticated email-based threats. We also saw that during the data period that the top file types used to spread malicious payloads, right? You're thinking like those email attachments that we're always keeping an eye on. The top file types used for those types of attacks were, no surprise really, archive files, PDFs, and HTML files. Um, the top targeted industries were the mining sector, entertainment, media, and manufacturing. And then in terms of most impersonated brands, our, our data shows that uh, the top offenders are DHL, Facebook, um, oh, let me, yeah, so DHL, Facebook, and DocuSign were in the top five, um, but they are the most notable because they saw some increases. If you want to see the full list of impersonated, um, go ahead and check out the uh, the, show, the show notes for that link to the full written report. But that's kind of our core data. Um, and our, our findings for this month. And uh, Michael, the one that kind of stands out to me when I think about, at least here in the U.S., the time period, you know, where we are in this given year is that it's tax season here in the yeah. U.S., right? Um, and so anytime, and I'd love to get your take on this, but you know, as I've been watching email traffic over the last couple of years, it seems like anytime there's some big like annual happening, whether it's the holidays or tax season or whatever, it seems like we see a slight de we see the slight decrease in the targeted email attacks, whereas there's a lot more like they're trying to flood the flood the web with these uh, you know, higher volume of lower effort attacks in the event to capitalize on whatever is happening in you know, in the world currently. So tax season, we've seen an increase in DocuSign brand impersonations. So they're trying to capitalize on things like tax season, trying to get people to click on malicious DocuSign sure. or seemingly DocuSign email links. And, you know, we see a higher volume of email traffic when things like this are happening. And I imagine that's probably what you've observed in the industry during your time in the space, right, Michael? Yeah, I mean, it, it's all about low hanging fruit. What's the easiest right. way to get into someone's mailboxes? What's the what are we going to cause a sense of urgency around that, that's going to make somebody want to click? Um, and and it could just be a ratio thing, right? That we're just seeing more of generic attacks versus target attacks because you know it's that sense of urgency idea where right. you know tax season. And I and I expect next month when you do this again, you're going to see a, a big jump in DocuSign because of the tax season. Yep. Um, and you may see some new um, pieces up there too, like maybe people were impersonating the IRS or whatever for obviously for the U.S. tax season. Um, and I'll, uh, I would imagine if you graph that out through the month, you'll see that those trends will continue to grow up to the April 15th cutoff date and then probably start waning off after that because most of the people have filed or have filed extensions by that point. Yep. Uh, if they haven't, then eh, they probably need to talk to their accountant. So. <laughs> That's uh, about right. There's something else <laughs> yeah. going on then. <laughs> sure. And, and you see the same in, in other, um, you know, areas too. So like when it gets to Christmas, uh, you know, shortly after the Thanksgiving holiday in the U.S., you see much more communication around Black Friday. Oh, you start yeah. seeing it before Thanksgiving, but then you start seeing it transition to Christmas and other things. And that fear of missing out, that, that FOMO, right, for people where it's like, oh, crap, I'm behind. I need to do this. Uh, it really weighs on people and it makes people click. Um, and they're willing to overlook the simple, you know, inconsistencies of an email because they, they have this concern that they're, doing something wrong um, or not paying attention to what they need to. So I think it's, it's definitely, you know, the, the, the bad actors out there that are doing these attacks, I think they do leverage that, that human element of um, anxiety and worry and, and everything else. So oh, for uh, sure. humans too. For sure. Yeah. And I'm thinking you know, tax season, right? I can, I mean, the, the impersonation messages almost write themselves, right? Oh, Hey, your, your, uh, your tax filing was rejected. 
click here to find out why, you know, I mean, yeah, things we, like that. We, uh, I did a demo last year around tax season where at the time, you know, GPT was, was all over the news, but I used that and, and it didn't have a lot of restrictions at the time, but I, I did a live sort of demo uh, where we went through and orchestrated an attack specifically around the IRS and it created, you know, the code to impersonate a, a website, an IRS site. And, and then, you know, it asks for a login of social security numbers and all this other stuff. And then it redirected to the IRS site at the end of all the data collection and it stored it in a, you know, encrypted file on my web server. Um, and that was something I was able to do in, you know, less than 30 minutes. But you know, shortly thereafter, and, and as the months progressed last year, it became harder and harder to do that. And yep. you would have to find new ways to ask for the same thing to be done. Um, and it was still possible, but it, it, it just shows that, you know, there's lots of tools out there to proliferate these types of attacks, specifically around these events like tax season right. and Christmas and other things. For so. sure. You know, I'm hearing the makings of another uh, another episode with you on it here. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I did much the same thing last year when, you know, the GPT hype was all the mm -hmm. all the rage, right? That's actually what episode one of the show is about. If folks want to go back oh, wow. and take a look at that. Um, we talked about uh, chat GPT and using it to launch attacks. And like you said, it's, it's more difficult to use it in that fashion today. Um, but there's, amazingly, there's still ways around it, right? Like last time I looked, and admittedly, it's been a few months, but last I looked, some of the guardrails were still not present uh, on the API if you hit the mm -hmm. ChatGPT API directly, which I'm going to have to go see if that's still a thing. And like I said, we should do a future episode on that, Michael. So Yeah. And, you know, one of the easiest things, and, and, and just to kind of fill this out, is, is you would ask for, um, you know, code to or give me an example of a message that impersonates a user to ask for this and that and it would come back and says hey we're not able to do that because this is a uh, an activity that's not right so if you rephrase the question as like can you give me an example or tell me a story and show the code that would have been used then it, it asks it a different way and, and and the large language model says oh this isn't someone who's trying to be malicious they're just trying to be informative so it, it spits out the code anyways right so yeah, yeah, it's an interesting <laughs> world there. That's a whole different area of cybersecurity. But yeah, we're going to have to talk about that. I've been actually wanting to circle back to that discussion. Just haven't gotten around to it yet amongst all the other security things that have been going on, right? So Right, right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, in our data, the other thing that really stands out to me here, and we've talked about this on previous uh, iterations of this monthly episode, and that is the mining industry. Now, again, we're always, we've got our, our, you know, industry threat index, which again, if you want to see how that's calculated, we've got that in the full written report. But basically this metric allows us to figure out based on our data, what industries are being targeted more than others. And mining this month is not just a little bit ahead in first place by a pretty good margin. It is, it is ahead. And on previous iterations of, like I said, this monthly episode, we've asked the question like, okay. Why, why mining? You know, well, the obvious thing is like, okay, precious metals, there's money involved in that industry, right? But digging into it a little bit further here in the last week or so, um, mining is, you know, very ingrained in several critical supply chains around the world. And then there was one other thing that I saw come up in several articles in my reading. And that was the fact that when you look at you know, the risk profile for any mining company. A lot of their risks are very physical, tangible things, right? Like, uh, you know, mine shafts collapsing and equipment failures and, you know, worker injuries and things like that, right? And um, the product that they're moving is very physical and tangible as well, too. So when it comes to, you know, their digital estate and securing it, it's often not front of mind, right? So you combine those two facts, the fact that they are uh, deeply ingrained in many critical supply chains, and then what I just mentioned about, you know, Know, digital security not being a huge focus it's kind of the perfect storm there in, in terms of threat actors go right um what are your thoughts on that michael before we move no, on no you're i think you're absolutely right i think when you when you look at different industries um you know they they hire people and they excel at their you know their faculties of their job so you look at the mining industry it's it's not there may be some it related items in there like the equipment they use may be very technical um, but the, the workers are somebody who are focusing on that, 
that blue collar aspect of the, the job because that's what the, the the mining companies are paying them to do. Right. So when they get to a computer terminal and they use their 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 email and things like that, they're in there for a very small amount of time. They're not paying attention to the specifics of signatures or the reply address or these types of things because it's not something they do day to day. It's not something they do you know every few minutes. It's something that they do when they have to and they yeah. go back to their job. So I think they put a very little effort in understanding what the issues around, you know, email security and just, you know, just making sure you're, you're clicking on things you should be clicking on. Um, and it's not any, you know, it's not saying that they're, they're, you know, not doing what they should be doing, but it's not their main focus of their job. So, right. you know, it's a, it's very, again, we talk about low hanging fruit. It's a very, you know, easy target for these bad actors to craft a, you know, 90% believable email and, and really, you know, trick the masses. And, and right. like you said, supply chain attacks are, are still popular. They were very popular last year and they will continue to be popular because um, it's an underserved market. It's a market that uh, no one really has, you know, paid a lot of attention to in terms of making it more secure. They're more focused on the production and then um, the efficiency of production. Right. So. Exactly. And I, one other thing that comes to mind, you know, I, in my previous life as an engineer and an MSP, you know, I, I worked with a lot of manufacturing organizations, and a mining organization is going to have a lot of those manufacturing elements, right? And I'm thinking specifically like IoT devices, programmable logic controllers, um, you know, PLCs. I'm also thinking things like uh, operational technology items, you know, uh, HVAC controllers, and things of that nature. Those things that you know, people will often just throw out there, put on the production network, and then they forget all about it. And those devices are usually ripe for attacks, right? Mm -hmm. I worked so. with a, I with a couple of manufacturing companies too, and their main focus on protection of, of email security or just web security in general was protecting the IP that I, not only they created, like the the CAD files and everything, but yeah. also that their clients were trusting in their midst, right, to to produce those elements or those those products, um, and they didn't want those those patents or those files, those schematics to be, you know, leveraged by a foreign state actor or anything else. So it was something that was hot and tight on their list as well. So, right. Just, uh, interesting correlations between industries there for sure. But yeah. anyway, um, that's kind of our data. That's, that's what I've got on thoughts of the data. Again, if you want to see the, the raw data and, and um, our, our exact findings, be sure to check out the full report. But with that, you know, let's move on to our, our news items that we're kind of commenting on this this month. Like I said, we're going to focus on um, the CSRB, the Cyber Safety Review Board's assessment of the Storm 0558 attack last year. I can't believe it's been almost a year now. Um, we're going to talk about the FTC's uh, report that states uh, 1.1 billion U.S. dollars in damages uh, last year for impersonation attacks. And um, then we're looking at the XD utils issue. So I guess let's start with the storm 0558 fiasco and again we've we've talked about this extensively on this show um i'll put uh, some links in the show notes to a few of the past episodes where we've talked about this but at a high level just a reminder this attack is the attack where um chinese nation state threat actors through a series of events were able to uh, procure a uh, 2016 consumer signing key uh, from Microsoft's infrastructure. Um, they were then able to use that signing key to essentially craft their own authentication tokens into Microsoft Cloud Services. Now, it's more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. And so ultimately what this led to was, um, I think it was 32 organizations, if I remember correct, correctly, were impacted by this, including the U.S. State Department, and that included individuals that were directly uh, involved with, um, you know, like Chinese diplomatic relations, basically. So, I mean, from a, a, a spying and, you know, national intelligence standpoint, you know, they kind of struck gold on this is the unfortunate reality, right? And I think when I look at the Cybersecurity Review, Review Board's findings here, again, this the CSRB, they are affiliated with CISA and the U.S. federal government. It's their job to look at incidents like this. I think this is their third report, if I remember correctly. Um, 
when they look at this, uh, the bottom line, and they say this very early in the report, is that this attack was avoidable, which, you know, if you look back at previous episodes where Paul uh, Schneckenberg and I discussed this issue, that's kind of what we said. You know, this was avoidable. Um, and, and I I have to preface all of this by saying, like, you all know that I'm a big fan of Microsoft products. You know, I don't want this to appear that I'm just dogging on Microsoft. But I think their product set is is great. What they've done for the industry is fantastic. But I want them to do better, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like and they should do better in terms of security. But the report findings basically make. 25 recommendations. Um, the big ones that stand out for me are, uh, you know, the uh, Microsoft should, you know, take a look at slowing down the production of new features and products to focus on security. So um, I think as of this recording, it was last week's episode, I'll put a link to this as well, where we discussed this, you know, the industry's very focused drive for innovation and how it, you know, is contributing to the acceleration of security threats. So that recommendation kind of by the CSRB kind of brings that whole thought process back to mind. Uh, a couple of the other recommendations that I found were really interesting is the CSRB wants to have all the major CSPs, the cloud service providers in the space, you know, Google Compute, AWS, Azure, I think they called out Oracle as well too, to basically come together and work on a set of standards and processes to make sure that um, they're all following best practices in terms of security. And I think the other interesting, I don't know if it counts as an official uh admission or not, but the CSRB's report kind of basically said that they see cloud infrastructure as critical infrastructure at this point, which I've been arguing for a while that that kind of is the case, even though it didn't officially have that label. But, you know, before I get much further into this particular uh, subject, uh, Michael, I want to give you a chance to kind of put in your two cents. <laughs> No, I, I think I think it's important, right? I think you know innovation is always going to be top of the mind for for most of these organizations because when you think about it, it's if you're not first, you're you're just ignored, right? Um, and and you know we were talking about this earlier is you know the the Wright brothers and, and other inventors in history, um, they didn't necessarily think about safety or security those types of things when they were inventing. They were you know going after the thrill of of what they were creating being sometimes the first or, you know, coming up with an idea and chasing it. Um, right. And they weren't always the safest things to do. And, and, you know, as a result, there were a lot of vendors in history that have perished because of their, you know, lack of oversight of safety and, you know, and, and since today's market security. Uh, so I think it's, it's very important because, you know, they want to make a name for themselves. They want to be top of funnel. They want to be first on the news. They want to show that, that they're still inventing to create, you know, satisfaction from their clients and, and new, uh, new sales. But, yeah, I think security is just one of those things that they have to do. And I, and, and I fully believe that in, in this case, too, I think Microsoft was this is just a, a key that was forgotten that had, you know, a tag of the address and where this key went to. And nobody knew that they forgot it. And it was just something that was there. So as new security standards get applied or developed or accommodated, they have to audit. And, and this might just be something that they didn't do or new standards were put in place. They're following new standards today. But you know, a key from 2016 was ignored because it was outside of the purview. Um, it's unfortunate, but um, yeah, I mean, I agree um, with with their findings. I think it is avoidable. It's just you have to be very dedicated to security and, and pushing that at the same time as innovation. It's uh, it doesn't make sense to to create a platform that's fully open that everyone can use to attack when um, it's it's going to be a negative you know effect on things. So yeah, right. I think, um, it's important. Right. And you mentioned the key, and I think this was another key finding uh, in the CSRB's report, is the fact that in Microsoft's initial communication and subsequent communications last year, this idea that the key was leaked through a crash dump in a development environment was kind of, they presented it as this was how the key was leaked. Right, it was via a crash dump. Just an excuse. Right, and it came out as part of this report. And I actually went back and looked at Microsoft's last communication. They updated it with this information. And 
admitted that they don't know for sure that that's where the key leaked from. And, you know, the the uh, CSRBs, one of the recommendations was um, more transparency, a call for more transparency. And their point, and I agree with this, their point is that had Microsoft Cloud Services customers known that it was not for sure discovered how the key was leaked, they may have made a different decision in terms of their own individual risk assessments, right? Mm-hmm. And this kind of ties back to something that I've talked about on the show um, before, and that is the question of whether Microsoft having this huge productivity platform like 365 will go as an example. If a security incident and the disclosure of said security incident could ever negatively impact the sales of 365 in this example, would they be fully transparent? And I think we've seen that maybe that's not the case <laughs> in in this example, right? So I think the calls for more transparency are warranted um, just with that in mind, right? So Yeah, and, and certain organizations and certain um, in, um, types of, of businesses, they're required to disclose when, when uh, you know, sensitive data has been leaked or compromised. So I would think that the, the developers in these uh, CSB should be held to the same sort of regulation and guidelines. Exactly. Um, exactly. And I, instead the other of worrying thing, about their investors, you know, right. And I, the, the other thing that's along these lines that, uh, Paul Schnackenberg and I have talked about is you never see CSV is reported to the industry about like backend infrastructure issues, like within Azure, for example, you never see them, you know, they're kind of hidden and under the, under the hood. Right. And so, I think that was one of the recommendations that was made in this report as well, too, is that all cloud vulnerabilities and security issues should be disclosed via the CSV or the sorry, the CVE process. Right. So I went into Excel mode there for a second. CSV (laughs) anyway. um, But yeah, uh, for those folks that are interested on this particular item, like I said, uh, Paul Schneckenberg and I, we're going to be doing an episode specifically on that report where we're going to go through each recommendation and kind of provide our thoughts. And we'll dive into it a lot deeper than we did on today's episode. But uh, Michael, the next item that we've got to talk about is the FTC's reports on impersonation attacks, right? And so the link to this is in the full report. So if you want to check it out, but the, you know, the, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission um, they take on, you know, a bunch of, uh, what do I want to say, complaints, reports from consumers about things like fraud and things like that, right? And uh, they tracked, if I remember correctly, the number was around 500,000, so half a million reports of impersonation scams uh, last year. And this is the thing, reported impersonation scams. And the the total dollar value of those attacks came out to 1.1 billion US dollars. Now, again, keyword there, reported. I'm sure there was a large subset of people that fell victim for attacks like this and it didn't get reported for whatever reason, right? And so, uh, Michael, you and I were talking before we hit record here that 1.1 billion seems... A little low, right? When you think about things, and yep. it, I, I have to imagine that's that's conservative, right? It's not going to account yeah. for for all things. And again, just what is reported. Um, and so, I even by itself, let's let's assume that this number is accurate for a second. One point one billion is not a small amount of money in any stretch of the imagination. And the reason why I I felt it was important to highlight this particular report is because as an industry in the security space, we've been so focused on ransomware attacks lately and these large supply chain attacks like uh, the MoveIt file transfer software attack from last year. That's the the one that comes to mind off the top of my head. These really high impact attacks, change healthcare. There's another one. That's the more recent example, right? These large supply chain attacks. They're very impactful. They're very newsworthy that sometimes I feel like as an industry, we kind of lose, you know, we kind of take our eye off of these other attacks, right? Like impersonation attacks in this example. And so this highlights the fact that this is a viable attack method for threat actors too, unfortunately. Um, What are your thoughts before I I continue? No, I I think impersonation is going to be the, I mean, when you look at the the landscape, it's the most, 
damaging type of attack there is because they're leveraging, you know, known names or organizations to um, l really sort of play on someone's better nature. Um, I've seen some random attacks recently that I haven't seen in mass, but they're starting. I can see this going in the direction of a, a more um, frequent attack is where the entire sort of email string is completely fabricated. And it's sent to someone who pays bills in an organization that shows that the, the owner of the company or the CEO or whoever has approved this transaction to this nonprofit yeah. uh, for a gala that's coming up. And it's like, wow, okay, it comes from a valid domain. It passes all the, the checks. Um, you can reply to the person. There's a person responding to it, but they fabricated the sort of transaction of, you know, yes, we'll sponsor your gala. We'll choose this package. Please forward it to this person. And then that person gets an email. And if they look at the email string, it looks perfect where the owner has approved, uh, you know, the, the $25,000 transfer. And here's a link from the person asking the, to send the money. It's like, wow, okay. They're not impersonating, any, impersonating anybody. So my question is, is with this $1.1 billion, I'd be interested to see what flags and filters they're using to come up with that, that, that status, right? And, and if right. it's just impersonation specifically, there's a lot of attacks that result in BEC compromises that result in payouts that, you know, wouldn't fit into this mold. And then like you said, like you mentioned is how many of these companies that are falling victim to these types of attacks that just aren't reporting it because right. it's, you know, either unknown that it happened or they just don't want to have bad press out there. So they've just paid the money and quietly moved on. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good question. You know, I'm glad you brought up that example. Um, that's something that came up. I keep mentioning previous episodes, but like he, we keep talking about things that keep jogging my memory here. Uh, Jan Bakker and I actually had an episode where we discussed pass keys. And I have seen, I don't know if I want to call it a misconception or maybe it's just wishful thinking. You know, there's no disputing the fact that pass keys are going to solve some big problems for us in terms of passwords and authentication, right? But I've seen some schools of thoughts that are like, oh, it's this magic silver bullet that's going to solve all of our phishing and security woes. No, that's not the case. And I always point out that, you know, like in an impersonation attempt like this, the password or the session token are not always the end goal. And the example you just gave, you know, injecting themselves into that, you know, accounts payable flow is a valid method for them as well, too. So not discounting pass keys. They're going to solve some great problems, you know, some some really tough problems for us in a great way. But I, I always have to clarify. And, and some of these some of these attacks really fall to the end user. We always like to call the end user the weakest link in any security chain, but they're right. also your biggest proponent as well, right? right? They're the ones that if you train them enough or if they know what they should look out for, it's important. And I'll say that every instance of this email that I've seen delivered to end users, it's always the, the people who are catching it are the people who are following internal processes for making payments. It's like, okay, I'll make this payment. What account do you want? And can I get your approval even though it's in your email? And every single time when that person has pushed that forward, they're like, no, this isn't me. I don't know what this is for. So then it's able to be stopped. Right. But it's internal processes, training the end users. I mean, I know we're, we're tired of hearing training the end users, but it's super important. It is. Um, you know, you, you teach your kids and you tell your kids all the time, don't talk to strangers, don't do this, don't do that. You know, make sure you turn off the lights or whatever. But we have to do that for end users too. Yep. Um not that there are kids, it's just we have to protect not only themselves, but also the business and, and everything else associated with it. So yep. um, it's a team effort. Exactly. It is a team sport for sure. So, well, the last time there's a lot more bad actors out there than the good guys. So there's a lot more bad actors out there than the good guys. So that's true. And I, I'm often reminded of the sobering fact that defensive teams have to be right every time threat actors only have to get it right once so yeah. i try not to have that keep me up at night but anyway <laughs> so the last item we've got on our list for the couple of minutes we got left here is um how do i want to put it a almost catastrophic security event and that is um this very strange potential supply chain attack on the xz utils package uh inside of many uh open source Linux distributions. So uh, XZUtils is a library that's used in Linux just about everywhere. 
in various ways, shapes, or forms. What's so interesting about this attack is, um, as is typical in the open source community, you have, you know, volunteers that are maintaining these packages, right? And so in this particular attack, um, and it's still early days, right? There's more information that I'm sure is going to come out. But it appears as of the day of this recording that uh, there was an individual or individuals uh, that were uh, acting as maintainers for this package for two years or possibly more um, and were legitimately maintaining the package to then eventually inject this back door that through this library and interaction with another piece of software uh, in Linux could then essentially tamper with and bypass the SSHD authentication mechanisms. And so this vulnerability, I've got the CV, the CVE listed in the, the written report, was classified with CVSS 10, right? Because uh, it could allow a remote attacker to bypass, like I said, SSHD authentication, which we all know SSH is used for remote access to, you know, Linux systems, essentially. And so... Uh, like I said, this was interesting just because of the links that the threat actor went to two years, uh, basically investing two years into maintaining this package. And then I, and I guess this is a weird twist of fate when you think about it. And I say this because I remember the days of Steve Ballmer at Microsoft calling Linux a cancer um, years and years ago. Um, but this issue, this back door was spotted by a, uh, a Microsoft engineer, you know? And so, like I said, weird twist of fate, but this Microsoft engineer may have just prevented a ton of pain and suffering in the security space, right? And so, um, just, you know, to kind of, um, you know, cover all the points here, this backdoor was present in um, the XE utils package uh, 5.6.0 and 5.6.1. Uh, Red Hat, and I've got all the, the relevant links in the written report. Red Hat has stated that um, some users of Rawhide, which is the, the, the development release of Fedora, uh, may have gotten the package. They claim that some users, depending on update timelines, some users using Fedora 40, I think it was, um, may have gotten it. So you want to double check that if you're using Fedora 40. On the Debian side and you know any Debian-based distribution like Kali, um, They've got their own notifications, but in terms of Debian, they stated that those versions were only present in SID, which is the unstable branch. And so typically it sounds like this package containing the back door really didn't make it any further than the development and or experimental instances of these distributions. So if, you know, if you're running these OSs in production, chances are you should be using the stable version of these, uh, these services, right? So, but the two versions you want to look out for are 5.6.0 and 5.6.1. Um, uh, Michael, I, I think I covered most of it, but if I missed anything, let me know. No, no, you're, you're, you're exactly right. So two years is a, is a long time, but it is a service. And, and we see in the industry, if someone makes access to, say, a compromised mailbox, the, the average time before they do anything is 90 days. And I think that's an effort to obfuscate uh, an instance or access request or some sort of interaction with the actual environment or the, or the hack. But it, it's funny, one of the reports that I read is that um, they believe that when they got access to be one of the, the developers of that utility is that they were leveraging Sock Puppet accounts to kind of smear the, the, the person who's keeping up the utility. Um, because when they look at the people who are making negative comments saying like, you suck, this is horrible, this release was, you know, abysmal, et cetera, right. et cetera. The users had no other post activity. They were all, you know, just random this and that. So they, they were right. socially engineering the person who was keeping this up. And basically it's like, hey, I'm doing this for free. If you think you can do better, if you can help me out, then let me invite you. And that's kind of how they got access to starting to be a, a, an upkeeper of that utility. And, you know, you go two years and, and who knows, maybe there was a good intent originally. Maybe they bullied their way onto the, 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 the upkeep, or maybe this was their end goal. We don't know. But, you know, if they, if they joined it, although with a, a negative, you know, way of entry with the idea of helping, 
you know, I, I doubt that, but I, I, I fully believe they, they knew what they were doing and, and using these accounts that were also kind of smearing uh, the person who was keeping this utility up to date um, definitely played on that social engineering aspect is like, hey, I, I, I'm tired of being called an idiot or you know, stupid or whatever. So if you think right. you can help me, then, then come on in and let's do this and let's keep it together. And that's what you see, not necessarily the bullying, but you see that in the, the, the open source area a lot. You have a lot of people that are there for the betterment of the product and the services and features that want to legitimately make something better. Um, so it was an easy sort of ruse to pull, um, especially with these fake accounts that were also agreeing with him or, or, Hey, I see all this. I can help you out. Maybe, you know, his account specifically didn't make any negative comments, but he was, you know, beaten down so many times and so frequently that he was willing to accept any help that he could get to make right. it better. Um, and then obviously when that new developer came on board with him, those comments stopped. So Cool. <laughs> funny how that works I, it's, yeah yeah it's always interesting to see with these these types of issues you know that we see the same attack patterns in in different ways so like in this case social engineering social engineering wasn't you know it was a means to an end to get the person in a place where they could eventually do the attack two years later so i mean when we look at this entire uh, chain of events it's quite um it's quite detailed, right? And so I've seen some news articles on this issue kind of making the assumption that, okay, is this maybe, you know, like some nation state actor trying to quietly inject a back door into the industry or again, still early days, who knows? Um, but uh, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on this one as we, as we move forward. Um, yeah. So and obviously, like you said before, if anyone's using this, um, please downgrade below 5.6 until they have a, a good fix for it. Yeah, uh, make sure you're you're checking your logs and, and everything, and then turn up your your logs as high as they can to, to make sure you're capturing all events that are happening. Um, yep. and then scrub things, right? So for sure. And I guess another mitigation, if for some reason you are unable to downgrade, I can't believe there would be no a reason why you couldn't. But another mitigation would be like, okay, turn off SSHD for now, you know, that might be a mitigation that you could do, but just downgrade. It's going to be easier. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's anything major lost between uh, the previous version of 5.6. Yeah. And not 5. that I'm aware 6. of. So yeah. anyway, well, Michael, I think we've gone for our 40 ish minutes and uh, we should probably let folks get back to their day, but I appreciate you taking yeah. the time to come and share your knowledge and insights with us, my friends. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. We'll have you back on the show at some point. And those of you watching, uh, thanks for spending some time with us. If you found value in today's episode and you're watching on YouTube, be sure to smash that like and subscribe button, as they say in the YouTube world. Uh, otherwise, you can find us on all the major podcasting platforms. You can also check us out at hornetsecurity.com. You'll see uh, access to uh, the podcast there, as well as a host of awesome security products. Um, I'm not going to do a plug here because this is the podcast, but it's there in case you guys are ever, ever interested. Other than that, have a great day. Stay safe out there, and we'll catch you again next week for a future episode of the Security Swarm podcast. Have a good one.